Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this week's episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week we are studying in your Come Follow Me lessons section 45 and for a few minutes I'm going to share with you the historical context of what was going on in the church at this particular time in 1831 that led to Joseph receiving this revelation now known as section 45. I'm also going to spend maybe even the majority of the time spending uh, telling you about what happened the day after this revelation was received because it's really interesting things. There's In all those verses, there's one where Joseph is commanded to do something and he doesn't wait. The very next day, he's obedient to the commandment. I'm going to tell you what the commandment is and how he responded to it and it's his response that blesses our lives immensely. And so you're going to look forward to it because here it comes. Now, before I get started though, I want to share with you uh, an email I received from my new friend who lives in South Africa. In fact, she lives in Mal Malawi, Central Africa. And I looked it up and there in Malawi, Central Africa, they speak English, but the native language is Chachewe. And in Chachewe, when you greet somebody, you say Malibuanji. Malibuanj, I think. Malib Malibuanj. And what that means is, how are you? So, starting out today, I'll ask Mali Buanj. I hope everybody's doing well. See, this isn't only entertaining, it's also educational as well. So let's get into it. Section 45, pictured here behind me, is uh, the hill, a little hill that sits above the Isaac Morley farm in Kirtland, Ohio. Now, when Isaac Morley moved to Ohio, and I'm gonna tell you that story briefly in just a moment, but when he moved to Ohio and his wife, his, he settled here, he bought 130 acres, then he went back east and said to his wife, I found a great spot, we're gonna build a cabin and have a wonderful life. And she moved out as well. And they decided it wasn't too long that they were going to have to build a little schoolhouse to teach their children and some of the local children in the area. And so they built a, a log home 14 by 14 foot, and they put it at the top of the hill behind their home and farm. And picture behind me is the top of that hill where that little schoolhouse would have stood. It, of course, there's no evidence of it being there today because the wood just deteriorated. It's, it's no longer here. But it's very small. And so we don't know exactly where the schoolhouse was, but it's it was probably somewhere in the picture that you see behind me and some wonderful, marvelous things took place in that little schoolhouse, some of which I've shared with you before, and I'm gonna share with you uh, some new stories today about what happened here. Um, but there's great reason that the local missionaries that are serving in Kirtland refer to this area as Kirtland's sacred grove, for it truly was sacred. In fact, it's, it's, uh, it's said um, that when President Hunter visited this area, this hill, that he quietly whispered to those in his group with him that this place, feel, he says, I feel, the way I feel here is the way I feel when I visit the Holy Land. It is this very sacred and holy place. And I'm gonna share with you some of those stories that give reason to call it sacred. But before I get too far, <clears throat> I do wanna tell you that here on the Isaac Morley farm, Joseph and Emma did live for a short time but in that time, Joseph did some amazing things in regards to the restoration of the church. 13 sections of the Doctrine and Covenants were received in that little schoolhouse that was seated, seated right here behind me in this picture. And a lot of other things happened. Let's get to it. I want to tell you, let's fast forward a little bit past section 45, and I want to tell you a story about Elizabeth Rawlings. Mary Elizabeth Rawlings. Now you recognize that name perhaps as she being one of, of two sisters that in Missouri saved some of the copies of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Revelations. And I'll tell that story when we get to Missouri, but this is that same girl. This is a couple of years before she moved to Missouri. She's about 12 years old. And uh, she comes to, to visit the Isaac Morley farm and, and the things that are going on here. And she and her mother had just been baptized. And uh, so they were, they were there with the saints. And I'm going to quote from her journal and tell you exactly what happened. Because it's amazing, and it happened right here at the Morley Farm. So in her words, she says, Quite a number of the residents of Kirtland accepted baptism, mother and myself also, in the month of October, 1830. There was a meeting that evening. Now remember, that's before Joseph arrived. There was a meeting that evening, and we learned that Brother Morley 
had the book. And what's the book? Of course, it's the Book of Mormon. Brother Morley had the book in his possession, the only one in that part of the country. I went to his house just before the meeting was to commence and asked to see the book. So think of it, all these members of the church. And I told you that last week or maybe the week before that 127 residents of the Kirtland area were baptized in three weeks when those first four missionaries came through town. And think of it, 127 people, none of them had even read the Book of Mormon. But they knew it was true because of the spirit that testified to him. So there's only one book in the, uh, in the entire area, she says. And she's a member of the church and she had an interest in seeing the book. So I went to his house just before the meeting was to commence and asked to see the book. Brother Morley put it in my hand. As I looked at it, I felt such a desire to read it that I could not refrain from asking him to let me take it home and read it while he was attending the meeting. He said it would be too late for me to take it back after the meeting and another thing, he had hardly had time to read a chapter in it himself, and but a few of the brethren had even seen it. But I pled so earnestly for it, he finally said, Child, if you will bring this book home before breakfast, back, back to his home, if you will bring this book home before breakfast tomorrow morning, you may take it. He admonished me to be very careful and see that no harm came to it. If any person in this world was ever perfectly happy in the possession of any coveted treasure, I was when I had permission to read that wonderful book. We all took turns reading it until very late into the night, as soon as it was light enough to see, or, or light, uh, late, into, late in the night, as soon as it was light enough to see. So they read all the way till morning. I was up and learned the first verse in the book. When I reached Brother Morley's, they had been up for only a little while. When I handed in the book, he remarked, I guess you did not have uh, much to read much time to read. I showed him how far we had read. He was surprised and said, I don't believe you can tell me one word of it. I then repeated the first verse, also the outlines of the history of Nephi. He gazed at me in surprise and said, child, take this book home and finish it. I can wait. But she continues, about the time I finished the last chapter, the prophet Joseph Smith arrived in Kirtland. Brother Whitney brought the prophet Joseph to our house and introduced him to the older ones of the family. I was not old enough at the time. In looking around, he saw the Book of Mormon on the shelf and asked how the book came to be there. I said, I sent that book to Brother Morley. Or he said, I sent that book to Brother Morley. Uncle told him how his niece, who is Elizabeth, right? Mary Elizabeth. Uncle told him how his niece had obtained it. He asked, where is your niece? I was sent for. When he saw me, he looked at me so earnestly. I felt almost afraid. After a moment or two, he came and put his hands on my head and gave me a great blessing, the first I ever received, and made me a present of the book and said he would give Brother Morley another. So Brother Morley, Isaac Morley, he lives out, out, west, out east, excuse me, and he goes out to the western frontier, uh, which was uh, uh, Ohio. And he heads out to Ohio in 1812, and he finds 130 acres of wooded land. He goes back, he brings his wife out, and they build a log home for them to live on, which was at the bottom of this hill that you see. And they, uh, they're living there for a very short time before Brother Morley is called to serve in the army. He would go and serve in the War of 1812 here in America. Well, he only lasted 41 days before he got sick and was allowed to return home to, to get feeling better. Well, this was very fortunate for Sister uh, Morley because they were very few out here on the Western frontier. Her neighbors were miles from her. Uh, of course, there's no electricity, so there's no lights or anything. Just a little candle uh, stick would, would be all that she'd have for light. And she's out there among the native Indians uh, who she's fearful of. Um, she's out there with wild animals, which she is also fearful of. I don't think she slept for those 41 days. But fortunately, to her, uh, um, to, to her gladness, uh, Isaac returned just after 41 days. And even though she had to care for him and bring him back to health, she was certainly glad that, she was, that he was there. 
Well, then the missionaries come out, or, or more people come out and start settling the land. The missionaries come out, they start to convert members of the church. And um, just before they do, though, Isaac Morley and his wife Lucy, they are part of Sidney Rigdon's congregation. And you'll remember last week when I told you all about the big family and how they attempted the best they could to live the law of consecration. Well, the big family all moved onto the Morley farm. And it was here on the 130 acres that they built their log homes and they had their large gardens and they were trying to live that law of consecration. Not long after, about, about two years or so, two and a half years in February of 1831, that's when Joseph Smith arrives. And when the, Joseph and Emma's, their, their first place that they lived was here on the farm. Isaac built them a nice little log home where they could, they could move in. It wasn't very long after they moved in that Emma gave birth here on the farm to twins. They only lived a few hours before they passed away. At that same time, uh, Sister Murdoch, the wife of John Murdoch, sister, and I've, I told a story about John last week, uh, his wife gave birth to twins also. Those twins lived, but Sister Murdoch passed away because of the childbirth. And John Murdoch, had been called on a mission. He was getting active in leadership of the church. He had a, a, a several other children uh, that he was caring for. And so he wouldn't be able to care for these new twins. And so he asked Joseph and Emma if he, they would adopt the Murdoch twins, and which they gladly did, of course. Now, it wasn't very long after that, about 10 months or so, when uh, these, uh, these two children, of adopted children of Joseph and Emma, were of course with Joseph and Emma uh, living at the Johnson Farm down in Hiram. I'll tell you that whole story when we get to those sections, of course, but they were down there and they, uh, in one night, Joseph was drug out of the home. He was tarred and feathered, beaten, and because the door was left open and it was uh, very cold outside, the little boy, the adopted son, passed away because of exposure to the elements. The, his sister, the adopted daughter, they named Julia, and she lived to be an, an, an old lady. Um, she had uh, children of her own. But to their absolutely heartbroken, of course, as they buried a son in Harmony before they moved west, and now they've buried three children here in Kirtland. That's getting ahead of ourselves, but I wanted to tell you just some, some more stories about the Smith family and what was going on in their lives. But here on the Morley farm, after Joseph had established himself here, because he was here, um, and uh, Isaac Morley gave that schoolhouse that was here on this hill behind me uh, to be Joseph's office. So this became the worldwide headquarters of the Church of Jesus Christ while Joseph was here. As I said, several revelations were received here, but another significant event that took place on this hill was the first or ordinations of high priests in this dispensation. And in that little humble meeting, they ordained uh, a few men to be high priests. One of those men was Lyman White. And Lyman White testified, quote, that he could see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now, a little bit more of, of the background of that. He was set apart, and at the conclusion of that setting apart, his attention was upward. And he said that the heavens opened and he could see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Next was Harvey Whitlock, next to give his testimony of, of this evening here at the Morley Farm. He testified as well that after he was set apart as a high priest, again, his attention was drawn upward, the heavens opened, and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father, is his quote. Well, the, uh, the events of the Morley Farm, they didn't last very long. Um, in 1831, later, later in that year, Isaac Morley sells this farm as he is given a mission to go and help establish the church down in Missouri. Those four missionaries that had done such wonderful work here in the Kirtland area had moved on to Missouri, and down there in Missouri they were having such great work as well, and new converts were moving into Missouri that Isaac Morley was called to go and, and provide leadership down there. I want to take a break from section 45. I want to take a break from um, the Morley Farm and just tell you a, a great, interesting story that happened here in Kirtland to Joseph. Years later, after what, where we are currently, so in, in a few years from, from now, according to the storyline, uh, Joseph 
has enemies of the church, some people who want to bring him down in the church with them. Uh, the persecution that he had suffered in Harmony and Palmyra and Manchester and Fa a little bit of Fayette had now followed him here to Kirtland. Well, it became necessary that Joseph have a bodyguard. And while he was in his home, there would be a man or two that would stand guard through the night and make sure that Joseph was protected from these enemies. Well, the changing of the guard came and uh, the man who was coming to relieve the guard and to stand as guard through the night had brought his little son with him. He wanted to introduce his little son to Joseph and, uh, and then the little son would walk himself home. Well, introductions were made and Joseph was pleased to see this little boy and uh, asked the little boy if he would give the, the, the evening prayer, and which this little boy did. And in that prayer, he asked the Lord to protect brother Joseph. At the end of the prayer, Joseph stood up, he looked at the boy, he looked at the boy's father, and he tells the boy's father, there's no need to stand guard tonight. The Lord has heard your son's prayer and I'll be protected. That boy had faith that his prayer would be answered. That's why he offered the prayer. But perhaps, not more important, but perhaps more as a wonderful example was Joseph's faith in the child. That, that, that the child's faith was sufficient to keep Joseph's enemies away that night. All right, let's get back to section 45. Section 45 is lengthy. And the reason it's lengthy is because it is full of so much good doctrine. Now, as you read the section heading of section 45, it's important to know what came after the, the section heading, which is not recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants, but it's recorded in Joseph Smith's history. So let me give you both quotes, because then we'll start to really understand, and it makes it very easy to liken section 45 to our lives today. Let me, let me show you. Section 45, it says that many false reports and foolish stories were published and circulated to prevent people from investigating the work or embracing the faith. And this, this brought the saints down. Their morale was low. Their, their excitement and zeal for the gospel was kind of overshadowed by these negative reports. Now, as members of the church throughout the world, we can find this to be applicable in our own lives. And let me give you a couple of examples. The saints were being bullied. There were people who were teasing them and making fun of them and saying they were wrong and pointing fingers at them. Now, I know that happens. I, I can't say that happens to everybody, and thankfully it, it doesn't. But there are people who could relate to that. But more generally relating to this, is the idea of false reports. Negative things were being said about the church that just weren't true. And the purpose of people making these false statements was one, to prevent people from joining the church, and two, to, to help people leave the church. Not to help, but encourage people to leave the church. And so they were being bombarded with false information. It makes me think, it reminds me of a quote from President, Hinkle, uh, President Nelson that he gave not very long ago. And it, uh, he didn't give a quote. He, he said it. It's his quote. But he encouraged us as members of the church to pray for discernment. Not only so we know right from wrong, but pray for discernment that we can know truth from error. And then later in general conference, he said that in the coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding influence of the Holy Ghost. And what's the purpose of the Holy Ghost? What's its, its, his mission? To teach truth. And that we can relate to. We get bombarded with ideas and concepts and stories and news or things that pretend to be news or different, different ideas out there. And it's only with the Holy Ghost that we can sort through what's true and what's error. It seems that, that news today is more of a commentary of the news reporter's opinion on, on stories. And so it's difficult to see what's right and what's wrong. And what you hear on one channel might be completely opposite of what you hear on another channel, or, or at least the, the way that it's portrayed. 
But this can, it's not only with the news, but we can look at it in, in, uh, in our everyday lives of trying to figure out what's right and wrong. And so we remember those two things from President Nelson. Pray for discernment and then get the Holy Ghost strong in your life so that you can know what's right and what's wrong. And so this is what the saints were experiencing in 1831. The same thing that the saints in 2021 are experiencing. False ideas, and we've got to sort through it to make sure that we cling to what's true. And what Joseph says is that the, uh, this revelation was received to the joy of the saints who had to struggle against everything that prejudice and wickedness could invent. <laughs> yeah, welcome to 2021, Joseph. The wickedness is throwing at us prejudice and, and the saints are struggling to know not what's right and wrong, but what's true and it's an error. And so when, when Joseph received section 45, the saints had a lot of joy and happiness because it helped them with the struggles of figuring out what's true and what's not true. And so the doctrine that's contained in section 45 should and will do exactly the same thing for us as it did for them, and it should bring us joy and happiness. So that's why we look at section 45 in detail. Now, of all the doctrine that you will discover in section 45, let me point out one, and it starts in verse 3. Listen to him who is the advocate with your father. Remember, we give that title, and he gives that title to himself, advocate. The Savior is our advocate. Listen to him who is the advocate with the Father, who is pleading your cause before him. And this is what he's saying. The Savior is saying, Father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin, in whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy Son which was shed, the blood of him whom thou gavest, that thyself might be glorified. In other words, he's saying, Father, I did the atonement. And, the, and because I did the atonement, verse 5, Wherefore, Father, spare these, my brethren, that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have eternal life. What I love about this is the Lord doesn't put a time frame on it. He never says, I will be your advocate. He says, listen to him who is your advocate, who is pleading to the Father on your behalf. This isn't the day of judgment. This is today where the Savior is saying, I'm on your side. I'm standing next to you. It's you and me. We're doing this together. And together, we're going to ask the Father for a blessing. And because of my atonement, simply because you believe in me, because you believe in me, you can access the power of an infinite atonement, which I will leverage with the Father in order to grant the blessing you seek. And the blessing you seek might be, this blessing you seek is limitless. It's any blessing that you seek. And so he teaches us right out of the gate. You guys are down. It's hard. But you know what? <laughs> You're not in it alone. There's nothing that we do where we're in it alone as long as we do what the Savior asked of us, and that is believe on His name. Well, we continue to go through here. We also... Um, uh, you'll see a lot of good doctrine, a lot of things that, that you see now why the saints receive that joy and happiness. And you'll see how applying these same doctrines and teachings and most importantly promises from the Savior can bring that same joy and happiness into our own lives. So here we go. I want to take you now to one of the things that Joseph was commanded. He says it, and the Savior says it in verse 60. And this will give us uh, some more historical stories that I'm anxious to share with you. Verse 60, now speaking to Joseph. And now behold, I say unto you, it shall not be given unto you to know any further concerning this chapter. Now, what, what happens up to, through verse 59? You'll read it and see. But he's talking a lot about the second coming. And a lot of the things that he taught his disciples and his apostles in the New Testament. So and then he kind of shifts and he says, And now behold, I say unto you, it is not given unto you to know any further concerning this chapter until the New Testament be translated. And in it, all these things shall be made known. 
Wherefore, I give unto you that you may now translate it, that you may now be prepared for the things to come. For verily I say unto you, that great things await you. And that last verse, I can't help but think that the Savior is talking to all Latter-day Saints. Because great things await you. What's the great things? The things that Joseph's about to translate, which we're in possession of now. Let me share with you what this, what, what, what this may mean. But first, he gives the commandment. Okay, He says, we're not going to go any further until you translate the New Testament. Now, I've talked about before Joseph back in Fayette. He started the translation of the Bible. And uh, he was going. He started right at page one, Genesis chapter one, verse one. And he he didn't finish the Old Testament before this commandment came. And the Lord says, you know what? Hold off on the Old Testament. I want you to jump to the New Testament, and then the saints, then and today, are going to better and clear, more clearly understand these things that are contained in the New Testament, the things, these signs of the second coming, and everything else is con- that he talks about in this section forty-five. And he says, but, and for verily I say unto you that great things await you. Why, that's, that's a cool, cool promise. I love that. So, in Article of Faith number eight, it says, We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. That's a pretty bold statement. Um, but then it's justified when we look at how many translations and versions and editions there are of the Bible. I did a quick research on it. There's approximately 609, or excuse me, let me back up. The Bible is, has been translated into approximately 690 languages. Now, were these translators uh, receiving the impressions of, of the Lord to help them through their work? I'm certain, sure, and why not? Were they translating by the gift and power of God as a seer, revel, a seer and revelator? No, they weren't. Uh, they hadn't been called to that position. They didn't have that ability. And so Joseph, in speaking about the translation of the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into the modern language, or at least in English, even in Old English, Joseph talked about the unlearned uh, scribes. That's Bold, too, because we continue to refer to Joseph as being unlearned, farm boy, right, with a third grade education. And yet they were working as Joseph Joseph knew, and we know that they were doing the best they could, but without the gift and power of God, they were not translators, prophets, and seers. And so Joseph says they were unlearned scribes. So as the translation, they were working through the translation the best they could, not only was the translation not, not God-given, but... The scribes were also trying to write it out the best they could. A lot of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible had to do with punctuation. And that punctuation, a comma here, uh, or a period here, changes the meaning of the verse completely. And, uh, and it, it becomes... Um, uh, and, and so when we talk about translation, it was, it was really like an English teacher. Uh, going through with a red marker and saying, you know, we need to capitalize this. We need to uh, give a comma here, a space there, you know, do a new paragraph here. And that was a lot of the work just to bring a little bit more clarity to the things that were being taught uh, there in the Bible. One of the um, most easy examples to recognize this, this problem and difficulty is that the Protestant English Bible has 66 books in it, but the Catholic English Bible has 73 books in it. So which Bible do we rely on? The extra information or is the extra information not necessary? And so we, Joseph come, comes through and starts to uh, translate to kind of fix some of these, these problems that these translators, although they were doing the best they could, some of the problems that they were having over the centuries. Let me take you to 1 Nephi 13. This has nothing to do, well, it has everything to do with Doctrine and Covenants section 45. But it's not included as part of the lesson material. But I, I wanted to bring you back to it to remind you of things that are going on. Nephi sees in vision. This is uh, uh, chapter 13, verse 24. 
And the angel of the Lord said unto me, Thou hast beheld that the book, meaning the Bible, proceeded forth from the mouth of the Jew. And when it proceeded forth from the mouth of the Jew, it contained the fullness of the gospel of the Lord. It was great. It was wonderful. It may have even been perfect. Verse 25, Wherefore, these things go forth from the Jews in purity unto the Gentiles according to the truth which is in God. But then we come down and we find, For behold, they have taken away these translators, these other churches, uh, these scribes, they have taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious, and also many covenants of the Lord have they taken away. It's been removed out of the book. And then in verse 32, Neither will the Lord God suffer that the Gentiles shall forever remain in that awful state of blindness, which thou beholdest they are in, because of the plain and most precious parts of the gospel of the Lamb which have been kept back by that, by that abominable church whose formation thou hast seen. So the angel promises Nephi, look, there's going to be a problem. The Bible is going to come out and it's, it's, not going to, it's going to change over time. There's going to be 690 languages. There's going to be dozens and hundreds, maybe thousands of versions of the Bible. But don't worry, the Nephi, the day will come when the Lord's going to sort it out. The Lord gives the commandment to Joseph in section 45 to sort it all out. So we'll go back to the beginning a little bit. I've told you a little bit of what Joseph did, particularly with the punctuations. But now let me tell you, give you some examples of what the King James Version Bible says and then what it says with the Joseph Smith translation. Because with the Joseph Smith translation in there, it opens everybody's eyes and understanding of what, of what the Lord really wants us to know. So going all the way back, though, when uh, Joseph first received the commandment to start translating the Bible, he didn't have a Bible. He didn't have much of anything. Um, he was so poor. And so while the Book of Mormon was being published at the Grandin Building, uh, from Grandin, uh, Oliver Cowdery purchased a King James Version of the Bible. Brings it to Joseph. Joseph starts poring over it. And Joseph, at this point, he would read the Bible, according to the accounts. He would read the Bible, and he was inspired to know what should what the um, verses should actually say. So he'd read along, and the Holy Ghost would whisper, take that out. The Holy Ghost would whisper, insert this, insert that. At that point, write this. Of all those things that the Holy Ghost told Joseph, it produced 500 manuscript pages. And in addition to those 500 manuscript pages, there was a lot of notes in the margins of that Bible, of the things that Joseph was hearing from, from the Spirit. How did we get it today? Well, the transcripts ended up in Emma Smith's possession. And it's a great story. I'm going to tell it. I'm going to conclude this video with it. But she ends up with it in her possession. And when Joseph Smith dies at Carthage Jail, then years later, she gives those manuscripts to her son, Joseph Smith III, who started a church by the name of the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then a century or so later, they changed their name to the Community of Christ, which it's known by today. And so the community of Christ has those transcripts. But in the 1960s, an individual, a historian from our church, went to the, at the time, re reorganized church, now known as the Community of Christ Church, and they had a, a relationship, a great relationship, which enabled him to take a look at those manuscripts and to make copies and to make notes and to take that knowledge and information and bring it back to church headquarters. Now, because the Community of Christ owns the manuscript and they have published in book form those manuscripts, the inspired uh, Bible uh, translated by Joseph Smith, they have the copyright on it. But through the agreement between the two churches, our church uh, has permission to add those manuscript notes as footnotes in our Bible. Okay, so that's how we that's why we have footnotes as opposed to an actual book. But that started happening back in the uh, 1960s is when we were able to do that. So let me give you some examples and why it was so important 
that Joseph be involved in this work. In fact, in his history, he said that this, meaning the translation of the Bible, was a, quote, branch of my calling. So we don't take it lightly. This is one of the things Joseph was called to be a prophet to do. There's, I, I've got a couple of examples here of what the Joseph Smith translation brings into clarity for us. So I'll give you this one, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 and 25. Uh, in this Joseph Smith translation, uh, this gives us clearer doctrine and instruction from the Lord that was omitted in the original King James Version. So the King James Version says this, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Wonderful. Isn't that great? But I bet you have a question. The Lord says, take up your cross. How? Lord, we want to be obedient. How? What do you want us to do? You want us to get a big piece of wood and walk around with it? What does it mean to take up your cross? The Joseph Smith translation provides the answer. So this is how it goes now. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Same thing, word for word. But now the Joseph Smith translation includes, And now for a man to take up his cross is to deny himself all ungodliness and every worldly lust and keep my commandments. Break not my commandments, for to save your lives... For whosoever will save his life for this world shall lose it in the world to come. And whosoever will, it, it, and that's all new, and then back to the original, and whosoever will lose his life in this world for my sake shall find it in the world to come. Clarity. Perfect clarity as to what the Lord's asking us to do. Now, in, without the Joseph Smith translation, it says, take up your cross and follow me. Well, we're left to figure that out on our own. But with the Joseph Smith translation, we know exactly what that means. And now we've got something that we can work on. How about a little bit of clarity? Let me take you to the book of Acts. And when I say by clarity is there's some things that, that don't line up. The story, wait a minute, kind of contradicts itself. And the Joseph Smith translation gets rid of those contradictions. For example, when Paul has his vision of the Savior and he's called to be a follower of, of Christ, Acts 9-7 says that Paul's companions heard the voice. But in Acts 22, 9, Paul's companions saw light and didn't hear the voice. Well, the Joseph Smith translation clears that up for us and tells us that Paul heard the voice and the companions saw the light. And so it brings clarity to some of those confusing uh, verses. But what about a social issue? Now, we could, we could give hundreds of these examples, but what about a social issue? Something that might be relevant to 2021 or more, more relevant, it's, and that is found, I found, of, of the many that I could have given an example of, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's about marriage. And in there, it gets kind of confusing. And there's a lot of Joseph Smith translations in there uh, because it's, uh, it's kind of all over the board. And it seems as though Paul is anti-marriage. But if you read the footnotes and insert those footnotes into the verses, into that chapter, as you read it through, you find that it changes it completely. And it puts Paul's perspective on marriage into context. And context is so important, especially on eternal doctrines. And so with those Joseph Smith translations inserted into that chapter, chapter seven of First Corinthians, we now find clarity as to the Lord's law on marriage. And it's great, but without it, without Joseph Smith's translation, it's not. Okay, let me conclude here with a story. And this is one of my very favorite stories. It happened in Missouri, and it happens years, years later from Doctrine and Covenants section 45. But it has to do with the Joseph Smith translation. So Joseph Smith concludes the New Testament, and he's well on his way through uh, the Old Testament. It hasn't been published. But Joseph and the rest of the saints, they leave Kirtland and they meet up with the rest of the saints in far west Missouri. Now, as these videos continue, you'll, you'll see that there's a, a, the church is being organized and 
Um, there's a lot of uh, church activity, members of the church in Missouri at the same time as the same thing is going on in Kirtland. We have two bodies of saints. You hear the Missouri stories, you hear the Kirtland stories. They were happening at the same time. But then there became a point where the saints in Missouri get driven out and they fall into a place called Far West, or they call it Far West, Missouri. And the saints in Kirtland can't put up with the um, contention and the adversary and the, um, and the enemies of the church any longer. They get driven out of Kirtland and they join up and meet the saints in Far West. Through a series of events, which I'll tell later, Joseph is arrested with Hiram and others and taken to Richmond, Missouri, the jail there, and later he would be transferred to Liberty Jail. And you know of Liberty Jail. Well, Joseph is taken into custody one night and the arresting sergeant threatens his life. And the saints believe the sergeant. What else could they believe? Um, everything was on the sergeant's side to actually take the life of the prophet. Emma doesn't know if she's ever going to see her husband again. It wasn't long after that that the saints got pushed out of town. They didn't know where they were going. They, they weren't going west. That was, that was more wilderness. They couldn't go north or south. They couldn't go back to Kirtland. They couldn't go back to New York or Pennsylvania. So they just started heading east, eventually crossing the Mississippi River, landing in Illinois, and then they'd find their way up the bank 40 miles into a little town called Commerce, Illinois, which they would rename, purchase the land and rename Nauvoo, Illinois. So that's where we're headed, but this night, they arrest Joseph, they take him off away, Emma doesn't know if she's ever going to see him again. She's fearful for his life, fearful for her life. She's got two very small children and two more toddlers. So she's got four very little children. And it's scary. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what's happening. And a man comes and pounds on her door and says, I'm taking over your house. Now, this story that I'm sharing with you has been discovered by the researchers at the Joseph Smith Papers. So you can go to the Joseph Smith Papers and, and hear this story that I'm about to share with you. I say that because you probably haven't heard this story because they found it not too long ago. He comes and pounds on the door and says, this is my house now, get out. Take your children with you. Her husband's just been dragged off. Don't know if we're going to see him. we got this exter extermination order. We've got to get out of here. We don't know where we're going. Now the man is saying, Emma, you and the kids, you're on the street, and everything in the house is mine. Well, this man barges in and does just that, and Emma doesn't have much time to react. She's got four small children, and she doesn't know where she's going. If you had just a few moments to prepare to leave under such circumstances, what would you get on your way out. And rem re remember, Emma doesn't have a mini uh, uh, van. She doesn't have a minivan. She doesn't have a truck and a trailer that she's loading up. She has nothing to transport anything. So she's got four little kids and what's she gonna grab? Food probably would have been a good thing, particularly the food that the babies would eat. Uh, maybe some warmth, uh, a, a blanket, some clothing, shelter perhaps, that you're going to take out into the wilderness with you, some tools to help you along your journey. Uh, these are some of the things that the, the, the survival list mind would start to think about. What am I going to need? What do I need? Maybe she saw some mementos, some family heirlooms. Would she grab that? She didn't have time and she didn't have the capacity to move much of anything. A neighbor saw the distress. And this is happening over the next few days, right? And the neighbor saw the distress and she sewed together pockets, two of them, and took those pockets and sewed them on the underside of Emma's dress. What went in the pockets? The Joseph Smith translation manuscripts. She saved the JST that we call, as we call it. And so of all the things she could have grabbed, that was it. She took those manuscripts, she put them into her dress, she hid them, knowing that if they were seen, they'd probably get taken and destroyed. So she's hiding the Joseph Smith translation manuscripts. She's got a child in each arm and toddlers clinging to each leg. 
and she walks 300 miles through the frozen prairie of Missouri to the banks of the Mississippi River. She walks across the frozen river and finds refuge thanks to some angels, mortal angels, that were there to rescue them in Quincy, Illinois. Several months later, Joseph and Hiram and the rest of them would, would catch up with the saints. And so I tell you this story because it's awesome, but I also tell you this story that when you're reading the New Testament and you see that JST footnote down at the bottom and you read it and it brings clarity and it brings understanding and it brings you closer to Christ, at that moment, you ought to pause in your scripture study and offer a prayer of gratitude for Emma Smith and the sacrifice she made so that we could have the Joseph Smith translation and so that Joseph could be obedient to the commandment that the Lord gives him here in section 45. Now, section 45 includes a lot of temporal signs of the second coming. Um, I've done a video about preparing spiritually for the second coming. I did it a few months ago. You might be interested in it. The link is right here on your screen now. Uh, below this video is a link to, the, to my blog where all of these Beyond Come Follow Me's are being archived. So if you want to go back and see a past week, that's where you'll find all of them. So with that, enjoy your Section 45 study, and I will look forward to visiting with you next week.